Hello, dear representatives of the European Geopark Network, dear honorable guests, dear friends of our UNESCO Global Geoparks. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak to you, at least digitally, on this uh, conference. My name is Eckhard van Hirschhausen. I was trained as a medical doctor, then I turned to science journalist and now I work on public television and my big aim is to strengthen the connection between climate change, between biodiversity loss and human health. And you may wonder why I'm talking at your conference and I can <laughs> exactly date why I met uh, Hans Hartmut Escher and I bought a piece of land uh, near Osnabrück in Fennermoor and this is the proof that I um, got a bit piece of wetland, more for symbolical reasons, but because I understood how important geoparks are. When I uh, was in research for my book, Mensch Erde, wir könnten es so schön haben, Mother Earth, we could have it so uh, beautifully and healthy, um, I was not aware of the importance of geoparks for Germany and Europe. But I had the opportunity to climb some uh, hidden places and hidden treasures in Germany. And I was flabbergasted. I was uh, raised in, uh, in Berlin in a uh, municipal in the capital town. But the beauty of um, landscape left to itself was really striking. And of course, I understood how endangered many of these areas are. And this is Michael Zucco, a pioneer of East Germany who converted many of the formerly Russian military areas to, um, uh, health, um, to um, National Trust, to um, biosphere reservoirs. Long time the people caring for climate, the people caring for biodiversity and the uh, health professionals were in three different groups. And in this talk, I want to convince you that probably, or at least one of the best uh, ways to get people emotionally engaged in uh, preserving nature and to uh, prevent climate change and uh, uh, the further yeah, worsening of the climate crisis is showing them the direct link between healthy planet, healthy people. And internationally, this is also known as One Health or Planetary Health. But uh, like my foundation is called Healthy Planet, Healthy People, it's the shortest link that I can think of. Many of you will know this uh, woman. It's Jane Goddard. When I met her, she struck me with a very, yeah, basic question. When human beings always emphasize that we are the most intelligent species ever to walk on planet Earth, why are we destroying our own home? And this question four years ago was triggering me to start searching for answers. And I know that many of you have been on this path for much longer I'm now a member of the Club of Rome, the Grenzen des Wachstums, the Limits of Growth uh, report, is now 50 years old. And so the big question is, what has been missing to transform knowledge into action? And part of it is the narrative. Part of it is the storytelling. Part of it is that we have used a um, for many decades, a very distancing way of talking about these phenomena. We have talked about icebergs, uh, polar bears. We have talked about uh, remote uh, atmospheric chemistry. We have talked about Bangladesh and um, people caring for um, the environment use <laughs> the word environment, which means there's something around, environ, us. And we're never in the middle of the um, web of life, what I prefer as a, a coining part of biodiversity. 1969, 
I was just two years old then, this picture was possible because all of a sudden we realized this is the only home that we have. It's the only planet with water, with air to breathe, with um, a global temperature that is bearable to human beings. And for people who like it more drastic, it's the only planet with chocolate, coffee and sex. It will not get any better anywhere else in the universe, not even for Elon Musk. But how do we go about preserving our own living room? We act like these golf players. The planet is burning, the fire is on, and we are continuing our everyday or our pleasure activities because there's so much uh, to do before we turn to something that might get important in the future. That's called cognitive dissonance in psychology. We know about these things, but it doesn't lead us into action. Perfectly put in the statement of Dr. John Sturman from the MIT, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. The limits of growth, growth I've mentioned. Holmer von Ditford and other science journalists did a great job and talking about um, all the evidence that there was even within ExxonMobil. And if you haven't seen it, please look, don't look up. A great Netflix uh, movie with great uh, Hollywood stars in it to show how <laughs> the imminent destruction of the whole planet doesn't make it into the media. I'm not going to spoil it, but uh, don't look up is a must see. Connecting the dots means climate change, the greatest global health threat facing the world in the 21st century. This is not my own statement. This has been said by the WHO, by Lancet Climate Count, and by all the um, uh, national academies and so on. But it's also the greatest opportunity to redefine the social and environmental de de determinants of health. If you look at the burdens of health, almost all 10, top 10 threats to global health are linked to climate crisis, to livestock, biodiversity loss. Air pollution being the killer number one remains a digit, a number, without knowing the exact people and the stories behind the tragedy that comes to life when I went to the Glasgow COP26 and met this woman. My daughter became suddenly ill um, with one of the worst cases of asthma, the pathologist said, um, in the UK. And last year, after a seven year long battle, we finally got air pollution on her death certificate. So she's the first person in the world to have air pollution on her death certificate. This to me is a good example of how you need a case, a person, someone you can relate to, to turn a figure of seven or eight million death, premature death, into something that worries you, into something that touches you, into something that you want to um, act on. The same with heat waves. Heat waves are invisible killers. In the summer of uh, 2020, they killed more people than the coronavirus. What did we talk about? <laughs> coronavirus. And the projections of temperature attributable mortality in Europe is threatening. We had almost 70,000 deaths by heat in the year 2003 already. And again, this is only Europe. When I went with, uh, to a Fridays for Future um, uh, rally, and I'm one of the founders of Scientists for Future, I was wondering what the young people meant by what do we want, climate justice, when do we want it now, until I saw this movie also at the COP made by the Wellcome Trust. I want to talk to you about the effects of climate change on me as a mother, and especially on these lovely boys who are sound asleep. 
because the heat waves are intolerable. You can even get temperatures as high as 40 degrees. In the eastern region of Ghana, where it used to be so cool all day and all night, it's wet. See it? This is a cool night. So imagine a night where the heat wave is on. Nós estamos aqui aproximadamente 30 dias realizando o combate. Muito difícil, né? Fogo de alta intensidade, muito os animais morrendo, muitas plantas medicinais infelizmente desaparecendo. Estamos destruindo aquilo que nos é um pilar para nos manter bem aqui nessa terra. Então, many people in Germany realize that it's a true threat uh, the climate crisis when we had the disaster in the Arta killing about 200 people and 30 billions of damage was done only in one night. The one thing that many physicians start to worry about is the uh, outreach of tropical diseases in the middle of Europe. And sometimes uh, the mosquitoes are used as an um, argument against wetlands. And uh, so we have to distinguish between tiger mosquitoes, for example, and uh, normal um, annoying <laughs> bits and bites and bugs. These are examples of the narratives that are offered by science and health science. We don't have to save the planet, we have to save us. The next big opportunity is to show how much we have to gain instead of always threatening people with what we have to lose. And here comes geoparks. Save biodiversity for eternity. I'm supporting the uh, Landscape Legacy Fund uh, very uh, um, heartedly uh, together with the Senckenberg um, Foundation and um, Christoph um, the, um, and other people <laughs> there. The most valuable thing that we can pass on to the next generation is not money, it's intact areas of high biodiversity and if more millionaires and billionaires would re realize this we wouldn't have that such a race for <laughs> the stars instead of race for biodiversity but again this has to be told in a way that people are connecting the story to their own values and i learned a lot from george marshall from the climate outreach um, ngo in oxford he went to uh, the K3 uh, Climate Communication uh, Congress and said what people rather care about than the environment is health, is faith, is home, justice, independence, family and children. If you talk about these values and connect, then you can open the hearts and <laughs> the wallets. Someday we will all die, Snoopy, true, but on all the other days we will not. What we are desperately needing is some sort of optimism, humor, and connectedness. And that's why I love to show this picture of my team in Bonn and in Berlin. And um, yeah, ever since I started to get into this climate and health um, connection and started to put myself and my public appearances into it, I found so many new friends and new great people and charismatic characters all over the place ready to help, really wanting to cooperate. And this is a very interesting world to be in and I'm sure that if I had been at your place we would have a great lunch together, we had a beer together in the evening and share more stories how to convince the majority in our democratic societies that this is the topic number one, healthy planet, healthy people. And because it's not us that will be facing the biggest threats, it's the next generation, I want to show one example again from out of Europe 
what children are suffering already now and that they're asking us, when can they be just playing? If you want to contact me, this is my uh, homepage, this is my email, but I won't leave you on such a sad note. And there's a fellow physician from Canada and uh, she has a great way, if you want to check her TED talk, Courtney Howard, and she puts our responsibility and our opportunity of being alive in the 21st century like this. Thank you very much and have a great conference. Yours, Eckhart Hirschhausen. Over to Courtney. And really, it's that thought that I'm alive at this moment in time. What a privilege to be able to be here, to be able to do things that can affect health, not only now, but also into the future. I can't think of a better way to spend a life.